This video was brought to you by Indently.io, learning Python made simple. How's it going everyone? In today's video, we're going to be looking at five wacky features in Python, starting with the walrus operator. And this is an operator which gets its name. Ah, this is happening again. For some reason in PyCharm, you can never start a script with a colon. I have no idea why it does this, but anyway, I'm gonna put a comment here they call it a walrus operator because it has two eyes and two tusks, and it kind of looks like a walrus. But what it does is a bit more surprising than that. And to demonstrate how it works, I'm going to create a database of type dictionary of integer to string. And that's going to contain the following values. The ID of zero for a Bob or a Bib, the ID of one for James, and the ID of two for Sandra. Then we're going to simulate that someone made a selection. So selection of type integer is going to be set to four. And as you can see inside the dictionary, we don't even have an ID with the value of four, but that doesn't matter because our program is going to handle that. If user walrus operator equals database dot get the selection, then we're going to print the F string that you selected that user. Else we're going to print invalid ID parentheses with the selection inside, no user found. So next let's run this and see what happens. And what you should notice is that we're going to get an invalid ID because of course we don't have any user with the ID of four inside our database. But thanks to the walrus operator, we were able to save a single line of code by turning this assignment into an expression. So right now it's checking if user actually contains a value and this value will be determined by this operation. So if we insert a value of two, for example, we're going to get that we selected Sandra. So first it performs this operation and then it assigns the results or the return of that operation to user. And after that, it performs the check so that we can use user as a normal variable. And the equivalent to this is creating another variable which will be of type string, and that's going to equal database.get. Or I mean, this could potentially be none. And with that, we check for the user. This is the exact same operation, except as you could see with the walrus operator, we saved one line of code without hurting readability. And I personally would find this to be much more intuitive, but of course you can use either approach and that will be perfectly acceptable. But I want to show you another example where the walrus operator can be very useful. And this example is going to be kind of disgusting. So huge disclaimer, use it when you think you'll need it and when you think it will make your code more readable. But this example will be used to show you exactly how it works. Anyway, we're going to have a function called analyze text, which will take some text of type string. That's going to return to us a dictionary of string to string or integer, or actually I want this to be a float. Then what we're going to do inside here is return this dictionary, which will first contain the words. And inside here, we're going to open up some parentheses and type in words, walrus operator is going to equal the text dot split. And this is going to raise a warning because we now have a third type here that this could possibly be. And that is a list of type string. Anyway, what's important to note here is that we were able to create this assignment inside the dictionary, which means now if we were to create another key, which contains the value of word count, we can now do something else such as word count, walrus operator, length of words. We are now able to use words as a variable later on in our script because in this operation, we both created words and used it to perform that action. And finally, let's create one more key value pair, which will be average word length. And here we can just round the length of quotation marks dot join. And what we want to do is join the words and we're going to divide this by word count. And with all that being done, we can actually test the function by printing analyze text and say, hello, this is Bob. And when we run this, what we should get back is our dictionary first containing a list of string, then containing a word count and containing the average word length. So the function works as expected and we were able to save a few lines thanks to this walrus operator. 
Now, once again, I mentioned that this example is a bit disgusting because of course this might hurt readability. Not everyone on your team is going to understand this at a first glance. So sometimes it'll just be better to create those variables from the get-go. So here we can type in words, type list of string equals text dot split, and then just putting words here. But I just wanted to show you that if you wanted to, you can use it anywhere inside your code. Moving on, we have a wacky feature that a lot of Python devs miss when they are actually learning Python. And this is the power of the underscore. Now in this example, I'm going to create two variables. One is called big number of type integer. And here we're going to assign it the value of 1 billion. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We have nine zeros there. But I must say that at a first glance, I would not be able to tell you what number this is without counting the zeros. I would either guess it's 100 million or even 10 billion. I wouldn't really be able to tell you without counting those zeros. So something we can do in Python is use the underscore as a visual guide. And actually I did this kind of weird. So let's move that here. And that just makes it so much easier to read. And watch what happens when we actually print this big number. It gives us back the number without the underscores because it's only to be used as a visual guide. And it also works with decimal numbers. So imagine you have a decimal number which will equal 1.0000000001. As you can see, once again, I really had to count that slowly. But with the underscore, we can make this a little bit more legible. And once again, when we print this decimal, we're going to get the same output without the underscores. And there's one last thing I want to show you with this underscore, and that is that with fstring magic, we can actually use it as a thousand separator. So as you can see, I used colon underscore inside the F string. And when we run this, it's actually going to print 1 billion using the underscore as a thousands separator. But unfortunately, this does not work with the decimal, which kind of makes sense because in all my life, I've never seen a separator being used for decimals. Up next, we have the matrix multiplication operator which is just an at symbol. And I think that's quite funky. It's not something you see being used every day in Python, but I'm going to show you how you can use it. And in this example, I'm just going to import from typing the self type because I will be using that in my class. And here we'll create a class called matrix and def initializer, which will take a list or first we need to type in the variable name. So data of type list of list of string, and that's going to return none or I think I'm high, this should be a float. Then we can type in self.data equals data. Anyway, if you ever want to define the behavior for the at symbol or the mat mul symbol slash operator, all you need to do is define the matrix multiplication dunder method in your class. Here I'm going to say other is of type self and that in this example, it's going to return a string. Now, obviously when you perform matrix multiplication, it's not going to return a string. So that's up to you to actually define the proper implementation. But in this example, we're just going to return the F string of self dot data at symbol and other dot data. And just like that, we can create two matrices. So the first one is going to be a of type matrix, which will equal matrix. And inside here, we'll pass in one, two and three, four. Then we're going to duplicate that, change this to B and change this to five, six, and seven, eight. And just like that, we can actually print A at B. And that's going to allow us to perform that matrix operation using the at symbol, which is actually quite cool. Also, it's worth noting that if you were to get rid of all of this and import NumPy, with NumPy, this is going to work straight out of the box. So if you have let's say a NumPy array that contains one, two, and three, four, and that actually has to be in other square brackets. And we were to do the same thing for B. So five, six, seven, eight. I sound like a dance teacher. We can now type in A at B, and this is actually going to perform that matrix multiplication. And as you can see inside the console, we're going to get an output which is the result of that matrix multiplication. Moving on, we're going to be looking at some wacky operations that we can perform using 
bitwise operators. And the first one is something silly that I learned from one of you guys, and that is the increment operator. And that's not even the official name, or it's not even an operator, but you'll see why I'm using that name. Anyway, here we're going to have a value of type integer, which will equal 10. Then what we're going to do is print the negative tilde of the value. And what that's going to do is print the successor or the increment of that number each time you run the script. So as you can see, value now holds the value of 11. Now, unfortunately, this is not a replacement for plus plus. I mean, no matter how many times you do this, the output is always going to be 11 because it does not change the value of value. Or I mean, it doesn't update the value of value in place. It's an operation that only affects the current value. So I mean, you can also do this with a number such as 100, and it's going to go up by one. Or if the value was minus 99, it's going to go up to minus 98. And to explain how this works, we're going to print the tilde of five. I'm just going to call it a tilde of five. But what this bitwise operator does is add one to the number and then negate it. So right now, if we add five, it's going to add one to it, which makes it six, and then it's going to negate it. If this was minus five, it's going to add one to the number and then negate it once again, giving us four because one plus negative five equals negative four, and then negating that turns it into a positive four. So adding the negative here is just a silly way to increment the number. And if you're not familiar with the bitwise operations just yet, I absolutely recommend doing a quick Google search because there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with the bitwise operators, such as multiplying numbers extremely fast. For example, if we use the left shift operator, on 10, what we're going to get is 10 times two, and that's going to give us 20. And if we do it in the other direction, it's going to divide it by two. So that's going to give us five. If we change this to two, it's going to multiply 10 by four, which means we will end up with 40. And then just like with multiplication, we can do it with the division, and we're going to get two as an output. So I find all the bitwise operators to be quite wacky because it's not something that you see being used every day in Python. And finally, what I'm going to be showing you as the final wacky feature of the day is something that I like to call a Lambda decorator, or it's not just something I like to call it, it's actually the real name. Anyway, what we're going to do here is import from date time, import date time. And what I'm going to be showing you here is something that's called an IIFE, which is something I learned that they use in JavaScript. And it stands for immediately invoked function expression. So let's create one of these using a Lambda decorator. And to do so, we're going to type in at Lambda F, or we can even type in function to make it readable. And then we're just going to call that function immediately. Now, when we type in def program start time, which returns a string, we can insert some code such as now, which will be of type date time, and that will equal date time dot now, and return the F string of now, with the time using this date time format specifier. And right below that, we can print the program start time. And what we're going to get as an output is the start time in my current user locale as a variable. And what's interesting about this approach is that this function is run as soon as we run the program. And once we run that, we can never run it again because what it does is run this function and then return this string. So as soon as this happens, program start time turns into a variable. And that means that no matter how many times we print it, we're always going to get the same output. So in a sense, we created a sort of constant. And to make it really look cursed, you can replace function with underscores. And again, this will immediately run this function as soon as we run our script. Now, a very common question is, why don't you just create a variable called start time and say it's of type string and do all of this right here. So we can just copy this take this date time object and place it inside here and then print the start time. And personally, I wouldn't be able to tell you why you shouldn't do this because I find this to be much more of an Easter egg and I honestly wouldn't see any reason to actually use it in a real script. The only immediate benefit I can see here is that you can include as many lines of code as you want inside this function. While if you were to create a variable such as this one, you're limited to one line unless you use some of that ridiculous semicolon magic, or I mean, you might even use a comma to put multiple statements on one line. Unless you do some of that silly magic, you are restricted to one line of code. 
which in this case is not a problem. But if you had many lines of code, I could see this being somewhat useful. But personally, I've never used an IIFE in my life. So I'll be curious to hear if any of you in the comment section have actually used this in your scripts before. So yeah, that just about covers everything I wanted to discuss in today's video. Do let me know in the comment section down below whether any of these wacky features were new to you or whether you have any wacky features of your own. I would love to hear about that in the comment section down below. But otherwise, with all that being said, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.